thank you for joining. This is the Oracle Machine Learning Office Hours. Uh, today we're going to do an OML feature highlight uh, using third-party Python packages from Python, SQL, and REST. Um, Sherry LaMonica is going to be presenting, and uh, myself, Marcos Arancibia, and uh, also Mark Hornick, uh, both of us are going to be on uh, Q&A. So if you guys have any questions at any time, uh, please make sure to put them in Q&A, and we're going to um, reply um, as soon as we can, okay? So um, with that, uh, thank you, Sherry, for uh, joining and uh, agreeing to present, and uh, please take it away. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Sherry LaMonica, and I'm a member of the Oracle Machine Learning Product Management Team at Oracle. Today, we're going to talk about using third-party Python packages in Oracle Machine Learning for Python from the Python, SQL, and REST interfaces. These are the topics we'll cover today. We'll start by discussing third-party packages and embedded Python execution, and the benefits and motivation for using them together. Then we'll explore the embedded Python execution interfaces, then move to a demo and Q&A. So let's begin with third-party Python packages. Python has a, a rich third-party package ecosystem. And today there are over 300,000 packages in the standard Python package repository, PyPI. And they cover a wide range of topics and scenarios. Third-party packages are a great source for state-of-the-art or new algorithms or specialized functionality. However, uh, many commonly used third-party packages are focused on specialized functionality and not typically implemented for scalability and performance. One question we often receive from customers is, should I use a third-party package on database data or not? And the first questions are, how big is the data? And is there enough memory available in the database environment? An important consideration here is whether working directly in Python is more performant. And especially for small data, working in open source Python avoids the overhead of the database's underlying stack SQL queries and may result in better performance. The next question is, is there an equivalent in database functionality? Because in many cases, in database machine learning algorithms data transformations and statistical calculations will have better performance for larger data and should be used when possible or applicable. And when equivalent, equivalent functionality is not available in the database, that's when your only choice may be to use third-party packages. And this is the heart of today's session. Another question that we often hear from customers is, what are their performance gains when using third-party packages in embedded Python execution. And th there's no magic here. The performance gains are the result of two things, running in data parallel or task parallel Python engines in the data environment, the greater amount of memory, CPU, or faster CPUs in the database environment compared to your typical client machine. And um, it's important to note that embedded Python execution does not automatically modify third-party code to be scalable or to run in parallel. So which third-party packages can be used with OML for Pi? In both Autonomous Database and Oracle Database, OML for Pi has dependencies on the packages listed in the middle column here. The top-level dependencies are CX Oracle, Matplotlib, NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, and SciPy, and the others are fourth party dependencies. The ability for users to install additional third party packages is available in OML for Pi for Oracle database, but not for autonomous database today. However, this is a high priority item on the product roadmap. Okay, on to third party package management. We'll start with PIP. PIP is Python's package manager, and it's built into Python. And if you have Python installed, you probably have PIP already. PIP allows you from the operating system to install packages from PyPI, like NumPy and Pandas, along with their dependencies. Sometimes you may see a configuration file called requirements.txt in the folder of Python scripts. And that file lists all of the packages that a project needs, and you can easily install them using a single command um, shown here, pip install-r 
requirements.txt. The configuration file can be any text file like packages.txt. It's that dash R flag that tells pip to install from the declared requirements file. And it can contain specific package version numbers or no version numbers if the latest versions are desired. Sometimes you'll need to use different versions of a different package for the various projects you're working on. And in that case, you need a way to organize these groups of packages into different isolated environments to avoid confusion and potential package dependency issues. And one popular option for managing your PIT packages is called virtual EMP. And virtual EMP creates a virtual environment where you can install PIT packages in an isolated way. And this is useful if you want detailed control over the packages you install for the environments you create. Um, with virtual EMV, you can create an environment with one set of package for use with OML for Pi, for example, and a different environment for other work projects. In addition to avoiding um, conflicting package ver versions, you can choose specific environments to upgrade as needed. So if you only want to upgrade one set of packages, you can just um, specify that for your virtual environment. And there are many, many other package managers available today, and there's no one correct way to set up and manage projects. Your preferences and requirements for customization and even granularity will, will guide you to the tool that best serves your needs. Now let's take a look at embedded Python execution. So embedded Python execution refers to running Python functions which, which may contain third-party code in the database environment. And specifically, it's the ability to run Python functions in Python engines under the control of the database environment. And those engines can be spawned in a data or task parallel manner. The functions can be invoked directly from the Python interface, but also using REST endpoints on autonomous database and using a SQL interface on Oracle database. And the results from embedded Python functions can contain both data frames and images. Um, embedded Python execution works with the OML for Py data store, a repository in the database where Python objects can be saved and passed to user defined functions. And we'll cover the data store in more detail soon, but its main function is to enable passing non-scalar objects like a model as arguments to your user-defined functions in embedded Python. The data store also eliminates the need to manage objects using flat files and enables sharing data science work products with application developers. So what are the benefits of embedded Python execution? It allows users to run your third-party packages in Python scripts in a parallel manner at the database environment. It facilitates the use of Python script results and applications where you develop your Python scripts interactively with the Python interface and then invoke them from um, applications through SQL or the REST interfaces. Python scripts are securely stored in Oracle database and can be scheduled to run automatically in SQL using the DBMS scheduler. You can retrieve structured or image results depending on your application's requirements, for example, a table, XML, PNG, or JSON. And all of these features facilitate collaboration among data science teams, allowing the handoff of data science work products from data scientists to application developers for deployment. And today, embedded Python execution is available on autonomous database through the Python interpreter using OML notebooks and through a REST interface. On Oracle database, you have the Python and SQL interfaces. An autonomous database SQL interface for embedded Python execution is currently on the product roadmap. Let's take a look at the embedded Python execution functions available in the Python and SQL interfaces. The Python function OML do eval and its SQL equivalent PyQ eval will invoke a standalone Python script with no table input. OML table apply and PyQ table eval invoke a Python script with a table as input. And these functions in the first two rows, they don't run in parallel. They're typically used when it's not possible to partition the data to run in a data or task parallel manner. 
The functions in the next three rows can take advantage of parallelism. OML row apply and PyQ row eval invoke a Python script one row at a time or in chunks of rows in parallel. It's often used for scoring. OML group apply and PyQ group eval invoke a Python script aggregated by a grouping column like color or state. And OML index apply will invoke a script specified number of times, so n times, and it's often used for simulations. And as you can see, there's no PyQ index eval. Index, index apply or index eval is really a special case of group apply where the index column is a numeric vector. And um, with n distinct numbers, one, one number is provided to each function as its index. So group apply can be used this way to achieve the same results. And now let's look at the equivalent functions in the REST interface. As you can see in the table, we have the same functions available from these REST endpoints. Do eval, um, table apply, row apply, group apply, and index apply um, are all available to invoke your scripts through um, a REST interface. And we'll go through that in more detail shortly. So you may be wondering, which OML for Py interface should I use? Use the Python interface to develop your functions and create reproducible, shareable scripts. And use the SQL and REST interfaces to deploy these scripts and applications. So, uh, for example, you can develop and share your own Python functions, including third-party code in the Python interface, and then leverage the parallelism and scalability of the database through embedded Python execution in Python or SQL. And then depending on your application requirements, you might want to deploy those same functions using um, the REST interface. Okay, so now let's talk in more detail about OML for Py script repository and data store and how they work with embedded Python execution. The script repository is a database table that stores the user defined functions and they can be invoked from embedded Python execution. The scripts are stored securely in the database and special privileges are required to create a script. On um, Oracle database on-premises, the PyQ admin role is required for users to create and drop Python scripts in the repository. And on um, autonomous database, OML developer role is required. Scripts can be private to a specific user or globally available. And a private script is available only to the owner. And a global script is available to any user. And users can grant read access on their scripts to other users um, and to revoke that privilege as well. And these are the functions for managing scripts in each of the interfaces. Um, You'll use OML script create or Py script create to create a script from Python or SQL. OML script drop and PyQ script drop are used to drop a script from the script repository. You'll use the OML script load function to load a function from the script repository into a Python session. And to list the available scripts, use OML script dir um, from Python. Uh, you could also query the user PyQ scripts view or send a GET request from the scripts endpoint in the REST interface. Okay, now let's go back to the OML for Py data store, what it's used for and its benefits. It provides a repository in the database environment that allows storage and management of Python and OML for Py objects. It serializes and unserializes these objects during um, save and load steps. And you can share Python and OML for Py objects with other data scientists through the data store by granting them access to your, um, to your data store. And perhaps most important is that the objects in a data store can be passed to user defined functions invoked through embedded Python from Python, SQL, and REST. But this is most important for SQL and REST since only scale, scalar values like numbers and strings can be passed. Data store objects can be managed from the Python and SQL APIs. And here are the available functions. 
OMLDS save saves the objects from the data store to Python, and OMLDS load loads objects from the data store back to Python. The Python function OMLDS dir and the database view user PyQ data stores will list the available data stores to the user. OMLDS describe and the view all PyQ data store contents shows the contents of a specified data store. And OMLDS delete deletes the specified data store. Now let's look at how parallelism works with embedded um, Python execution functions. Okay. Autonomous database offers parallelism through different service levels. The service levels low, medium, and high control the degree of parallelism for jobs. Low has a maximum of two degrees of parallelism, medium four, and high has a maximum of eight. Specifying parallel equal to true corresponds to the service level, and passing an integer to the parallel argument is limited by the service level. Um, so, for example, with the medium service level, which caps at four parallel engines, setting parallel equal to six becomes parallel equal to four in effect. For SQL, auto scaling and um, adds compute resources on demand. And this can be up to three times for CPU and memory. And I included a link here. Mark um, G and Marcos published some benchmarks in this blog, Machine Learning Performance on Autonomous Database. And you can check this out. Um, the link has good information, further details. Manually specifying parallelism in the Python interface is done through the parallel argument. The parallel argument maps to the database parallel query hint, and it's supported with OML group apply, OML row apply, and OML index apply. And it can take as input an integer for a specific degree of parallelism, false for one or no parallelism, true takes on the um, input data arguments default parallelism, and null for the database default. In the SQL interface, parallel query execution is prioritized first by the parallel hint, then the parallelism set on the table. The parallel query hint takes precedence and is specified directly in the SQL query. And you can also specify a degree of parallelism on the table itself as shown here. If a query has a parallel hint specification and a degree of parallelism set on a table. The hint will take precedence over the ta table parallelism setting. Okay, let's get a closer look at the interfaces for embedded Python execution. So here in the Python interface, we are using row apply to score the model on the iris table. Model mod was created in Python, saved to data store DS mod, and now we're loading the model in the scoring function score underscore mod and scoring it on the iris table 10 rows at a time and returning the results in a single table. Here's the equivalent invocation from the SQL interface using PyQ row eval. We, um, we run a select statement and that invokes PyQ row eval on the score mod function. And again, it's 10 rows per function invocation. We pass a parallel query hint to specify two degrees of parallelism. The control argument OML connect um, is for the database connection. And we pass the model store, model and data store names, the desired return format, 10 rows per invocation, and the function name. This is the equivalent REST API call, which will run in synchronous mode. Um, this is a post request initiated from curl, but you can use any REST client that you prefer, such as Postman. And the REST API includes the autonomous database URL, the tenant and database name, the table being used for scoring, which is Iris. Again, 10 rows per invocation of the script that we want the script to run in parallel under the service level medium using the row apply operation with the score mod function saved in the script repository. And while this is run in synchronous mode, asynchronous mode is available. 
Now, uh, very soon, this URL for the REST interface calls is going to change, and it will be more simplified for users. So uh, keep this in mind, and we will keep you informed about the changes in a future session. Okay, let's proceed to the demo. Okay, so the points that I wanted to show you here are the slides that we just looked at. That model mod that I just created, I started out by building a third-party scikit-learn model. And first, I, um, I do some data prep. I'm loading the IRIS data set from scikit-learn and combining the target and predictor values into a pandas data frame. And then I'm using the OML create function to create a, a persistent database table IRIS um, from, from the data frame. And we also refer to that as an OML proxy object. And here I'm, I'm building the model. As you can see, it's just a simple linear regression and then I'm scoring the data locally. One, one thing that um, a best practice, and we talk to customers about this all the time, is to run your code here in the Python interface. And this is the, um, this is the autonomous database Python interface. Uh, we use Zeppelin notebooks. If you were using on-premises, you might have a different notebook interface like Jupyter, but I'm showing in the autonomous, um, showing you this example in the autonomous database interface today, but it would look very similar on-premises. Anyway, so um, building a scatter plot and I'm building a model. Um, but what I want to show you, I want to get down to the point where we are actually creating our scoring function score underscore mod. Okay, so here we are. I'm actually using OML DS save to save that model to the OML for Pi data store. And um, I'm giving the data store a name, DS underscore mod. Overwrite equals true uh, indicates that if we have an object um, in the data store with that name that we're going to overwrite it and replace it with this with this object. And then I'm providing a, a string um, description so that I can remember what this object is later on. To check the contents of the data store, I use OMLDS dir and provide the name of my data store. And as you can see, I get back the data store name, the number of objects and the size of that object, the date it was saved and the description that I had provided when saving it. And here's our score mod function. And as you can see, it, it loads the data store using OMLDS load. Con in it containing the model, and then it performs the scoring. This um, to globals equals false. What we're doing there is we're saying we want to load that into a uh, dictionary objects instead of the the working the Python working directory. And I'm doing that here. I'm loading the data store into this object regr, and then um, and then performing the scoring. And then I test it on local data as a best practice, just to make sure everything is working fine. I always want to do that in the Python interface. And now I'm checking the output of the scoring using um, row apply. So this is the example from our previous slide. And it takes um, as inputs the proxy object iris, the function score mod that we defined and that we want 10 rows um, scored at a time and the output um, shape basically that we want the result to be returned as a single table. We get our petal length predictions. The next step, I'm actually um, defining this same score mod function as a string with the same name, score underscore mod. We do this because it's a requirement to save it to the script repository. So this function has to be saved to the script repository as a string representation of the function. And I went ahead and ran the same row apply on the string representation of the function just to ensure that the output is the same. And it is. Now I'll use OML script create to store the script 
in the, the function in the script repository as a Python script. And I here again, I overwrite score underscore mod if there's another object in the script repository that has the same name. And I provide a, a prediction, prediction of petal length using scikit-learn so that I can remember what that is later. To check the contents of the script, I'm using OML scripter and um, I'm asking it to return all, all of these different properties about the script. But you can specify only one if you want, or if you only want to know like the, the owner and the, the name or the description and the date or just the script contents. Okay, so now that the model is saved in the script repository, I can score it using um, REST and, and SQL as well. And I'll show you, first I'll show you the REST interface. The first thing that I need to do in the REST interface is to, is to get a token. And essentially what you're doing here is you're exchanging your Oracle machine learning credentials, your user credentials, your username and password for a token that can be used in all of your REST calls. And the requirements there, um, which we set as environment variables when we're working with this to make it easier, is the OML server, which is the autonomous database URL, the tenancy OSID, saved as tenant, the um, Oracle machine learning username and password, and the database name. And here is the curl command to get the token. So I'm passing my credentials to this token endpoint and I will get a token back. And this is a, a very shortened truncated version of what that looks like. It's much longer, but the, the next step is to take that thing, that token, save it to a variable and then use it in your scoring function. And here's the curl command for the REST API invocation. So we're invoking the score mod function in the script repository using a post request using curl. Again, you can use postman if you prefer. Um, <clears throat> we've set the parallel flag to true to leverage the database parallelism according to the service level in autonomous database. And in, we specify that in the service parameter, service medium. Again, the fault REST API execution is synchronous. So um, we, would, we would wait for the REST API to call, call to the results to return before we could um, run another call. But if you prefer asynchronous mode, that's available through um, a simple flag in the, in the post request. And this is what your response looks like. It comes back in a JSON formatted object. And here's the equivalent um, command for SQL interface invocation. I obviously did not run either one of these in the notebook. I'm just saving them here for illustration purposes. I ran this against my um, development environment um, <clears throat> in PuTTY, but I'm showing you here that the we have PyQ row eval. Again, um, this is the same example that you saw earlier in the slide. We have the OML connect um, special argument to, for the database connection. Um, we passed the model name and the data store name and the um, return format that we'd like, the number of rows, um, you know, chunks of rows, 10, 10 in each chunk, and the function that we are um, passing to PyQ row eval, which is score.mod. And um, this is a portion of the output that you would receive. Okay, so let's move to the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sherry. It was a, it was a great session. With actually, we had lots of lots of uh, questions. Uh, we were um, able to answer, I think, everything so far. Um, if you guys have any more questions, uh, again, please feel free to uh, type them in into the Q&A. Yeah. We have one question on the chat. Um, is AutoML available on the on-premises uh, database? And the answer is yes. Um, the AutoML capability 
uh, as part of OML for Pi is available on autonomous database as well as uh, the supported uh, on-premises database, which is currently 21C. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Any other questions? Yes, one, uh, one other question is, are there any limitations on libraries used? So I guess the question is, uh, again, on third-party packages, right? The only um, thing that comes to mind offhand is that if you have, um, if there are any Python packages, and we see this with the R interface as well, that make um, additional um, calls out from C++ back to Python, that can be problematic, but there's there are ways to work around that so that it does work. So that's the good news. Great, any other questions, guys? Uh, another one is Anaconda supported uh, with database, how database calls this Python uh, environment? No, we don't support Anaconda to um, Anaconda or Conda packs. In OMO for Pi. Another one, is there a difference between 19C and 21C OML? Um, well, uh, 21C has the XG boost algorithm and 19C does not. That's right. the only difference I can think about. Um, There's also the M set algorithm. I think that was the other one oh, right, that was, right. was added there. But that, those are sort of the two key. Uh, right. But, but also in terms of OML for Pi, I don't think there's any difference, right? No, not for OML for Pi specifically. Correct. Great. Then another question is, is it possible to enable R or only support Python? In autonomous database? I imagine it's an on-premise, right? Um, so, so um, one way of thinking about the question is, can you use um, Oracle Machine Learning for R and Oracle Machine Learning for Pi in the same environment? And the answer is yes, you can. They can be configured to run on the same database instance on premises. And eventually we'll have an R interpreter on autonomous database as well. Right, and then, uh... Another question, can we use non-database algorithms using OML for Pi? Yes, through third-party packages through um, embedded Python execution. Exactly, or you can even write your own um, package code if you wanted to. You could write your own functions and use those in embedded Python execution as well. Perfect, and that, that, that actually also answers one of the questions that I think Mark answered before, right, Mark, on, in terms of whether, exactly. you, whether you could write your own uh, script. Mm -hmm. And your own class and how would you would uh, perhaps reuse that. Right. Another question is, will Python packages uh, or environments be shared between users of the same PDB in autonomous? I think um, you mean, are you talking about like using virtual env between... Um between users at the database environment? The answer to that would be no. Um, on the, uh, the package managers are used on the client side and on the server side, you will need to install all of the packages that you need and the way that you would separate them out for different projects is to specify different directories. Right, but, but this, in this case is an autonomous database. So it's even less than that, right? Right, exactly. Uh, now, Autonomous is going to run one set of Python uh, servers per user, right? So if you have a yeah. different user, you're not going to share um, information there. At that yeah, level. I, I think a related uh, topic on that is uh, we're not, uh, you're not configuring, say, a container with those packages pre-installed. So uh, those would be loaded um, you know, each time you, you ran your, uh, say, notebook uh, from that standpoint. Right, right. Okay, another question. Do we need to move data out of database for using non-database algorithms? Um, you, sometimes you do in your, um, depending on how the data is being used in third-party packages, you may need to do a pull on the data to pass it to the, to the algorithm in your function. 
Yeah, just a, a follow on to that is that um, the uh, some of the functions for embedded uh, Python execution actually take as the first um, argument the the data frame proxy object that you want to use. And so that is pulling the data and feeding it into your function in the embedded um, Python uh, environment. And so that in that case, the data is coming out of the database into that Python environment. One of the things that Sherry pointed out earlier was um, you do get some optimizations of that because you're still within the same database environment, uh, but it's not the same as in database machine learning like we have for the uh, in database algorithms. Another one, can we extract data from multiple sources? Well, you, I mean, you, you can, right? In terms of, if you're, if you're asking about the autonomous database, right, then you can have actually autonomous database point to external data, right? So you can act, connect, connect to data in uh, object storage, you can connect to even GitHub data, um, and then you can process that data. Now that data needs to be pulled in to the autonomous database so that OML for Py can see that as a as a proxy object and use it right to run. So that's the idea. If you have a, uh, that on premises, then your Python can even pull data from uh, uh, multiple sources as well. And actually, OML for Py in autonomous can pull data from GitHub into um, you know a pandas data frame right using a, using a PD read right. So there there's really a lot of flexibility depending on the, on what you need but of course you have to be careful with the volume of data right that you're pulling if you're if you're planning on using python python's memory itself right to handle that and depending on the volume of data you might you might run out of memory in that python session that we uh create for you right okay i think there are no additional questions um again thank you very much sherry for the excellent presentation a um, lot of uh, a lot of questions, so it was a great uh, engagement. And um, see you guys uh, next week then. Um, and uh, thank you very much again. And uh, stay safe. Thank you, everybody.